an organized Good evening. Ulysses, the solar polar probe, is now flying over the south pole of the sun and showing us regions we've never properly seen before because normally we see the sun broadside on, so to speak. Oddly enough, Ulysses is further away from the sun than we are and will never go closer. All the same, we are learning a great deal from it. And of course, we are still getting pictures back of the impact of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 on Jupiter. This Hubble picture shows impact G, and this superb picture shows the full effects. And I think that the effects of that are going to take a long time to die away. Of course, the actual impacts occurred on the side of Jupiter turned away from us, but they were observed by the Galileo spacecraft. That's an impression of Galileo, though it's not quite right, because I'm afraid the high-gain antenna has not unfurled properly, which is why it was out so slow to come back. But we have got these pictures of impact W, taken at intervals of just over two seconds. You can see there the main flash on the third picture, possibly due to the fireball, as the comet's body actually hit Jupiter itself. Now, those results were given at the recent meeting of the International Astronomical Assembly, held in The Hague, I was just back from there. And also shown there was a picture of a newly discovered galaxy, found by the Dutch with the Radio Astronomy Telescope and confirmed at Panama. A rather a blurred picture, simply because it lies almost behind the Milky Way, which is why it's not been seen before, or not identified before. But it appears to be a rather large spiral, something like nine million light years away, not very far beyond our own local group. Now, it's often said that the evening sky in autumn is less interesting than at other times of the year. In a way, I suppose that's true. We haven't yet got all round, and we're starting to lose the brilliant summer stars, but at least we do have planets. At the moment, Venus is very low down in the southwest after sunset. It's really very brilliant, of course. We are losing Jupiter now in the evening twilight, and Mars is a morning object not well placed yet. But at least we have Saturn visible in the southeast after sunset. And there's a drawing I made a few nights ago with my 15-inch reflector. And you can see the rings there. They're made of, of course, icy particles going around Saturn. But they are not so well placed as they were a few years ago. Because the rings are measure 169,000 miles from one end to the other, but they are probably less than a mile thick. In the early 1990s, we saw the rings from a very favorable angle, and Saturn looked like this. But it's not quite like that now. They're closing up as seen from Earth. Now they've got to about this situation. And next year in 1995, they're going to be edgewise onto us, so they'll appear only as a thin line of light. And in small telescopes, you won't see them at all for a bit. After that, they'll start to open out again. But meanwhile, the rings are visible with a small telescope. And uh, do have a look at them if you can. You can find Saturn easily enough. And to my mind, telescopically, it is the loveliest object in the entire sky. You know, some people have said to me, it's hard to identify the stars. I don't think that's true. Remember, there are only a few thousand stars visible with the naked eye, and my method has always been to select a few unmistakable groups or constellations and then use them as guides to all the rest. And undoubtedly, the two best guides are Orion the Hunter and Ursa Major the Great Bear. At the moment, Orion's not in the evening sky, it will be, of course, in the winter. But Ursa Major, the Great Bear, is. And over Britain, it never sets, so you can always find it somewhere. Now it's low down in the northern sky. And the seven stars making up what we normally call the plough can't be mistaken. I rather like this picture I took home a little while ago. See the bear's tail or the handle of the plough point pointing downwards. And that black mass over to the right is, I'm afraid, an inconvenient chimney. But certainly, Ursa Major is a splendid marker. The two right-hand stars are known as the pointers, because they show the way to Polaris, the pole star, in Ursa Minor, the little bear. And Polaris lies within one degree of the polar point, and therefore it appears to stay almost still in the sky, and you always know where it is. The little bear itself, by the way, is not very bright, curved down over the great bear's tail, but I'm afraid you're not going to see the little bear stars uh, on a light night, and therefore that, you've really got to wait until the moon's out of the way, and at the moment, the moon, I'm afraid, is rather obtrusive. On the far side of the pole star, we have the W or M of Cassiopeia. And that also is, is circumpolar from here. That's to say it never sets, and the five brightest stars are quite unmistakable. They make up a very characteristic W or M form. 
And also near Cassiopeia, we have the constellation of Perseus, the legendary hero. Not very distinctive in shape, but with one fairly bright star and some very interesting objects. Well, those are all on view now. But the main autumn constellation is Pegasus, the flying horse. And the four main stars of Pegasus make up a well-defined square. And that's a photograph of it, but I always feel that photographs, and for that matter maps, make the square look rather brighter and smaller than it really is. But it's distinctive enough. In mythology, uh, it was a flying horse, but the four main stars do form that characteristic square pattern. There's the picture of the actual mythological horse, uh, in uh, the old legend, written by the hero Bellerophon in quest of a particularly nasty, fire-breathing monster known as the Chimera. But certainly in the sky, these four stars do make up a well-defined square. And they've all got their own proper names. And those names are Scat, Alphalats, Markab, and Algonib. And the, the three of them are white, and the fourth one, Scat in the upper right, is orange. Now, you might think that those four stars in the square make up a genuine pattern. But in point of fact, they don't. Remember, a constellation has no real meaning at all, because the stars are at very different distances from us, and we are simply dealing with line of sight effects. And of those stars, the most distant, over 500 light years away, is Algonib, and the closest is Alpha Rats. So let's now put them in to their correct distances. And you can see what's happening. Over to the right is Algonib. Looks the fancy of the four, much the most powerful, over a thousand times brighter than the sun, and there they are to their correct distances. So in fact, Algonib is further away from Markab than we are. And in astronomy, as in so many other things, appearances can be very deceptive indeed. But from the Earth, from that point of view, they appear as a well-defined square. I'm not going to say it's a very rich area, but of course, binoculars and telescopes show many stars there. Now, this picture was taken by Douglas Arnold, shows many stars. But we're going to dim it down now and show you only the stars that are prominent with the naked eye. And when we do that, well, there we have the square once again. And when the moon is out of the way, have a look with the naked eye and see how many stars you can see inside the square. And there are not very many of them. But one thing you can do is to look at those four stars, one after the other, and then you'll see straight away that although three of them are white, the fourth one, scat, is decidedly orange. And that indicates that the surface temperature is lower than that of the other three, although in fact scat is a very large star, very much larger than our sun. Now, most stars, including our sun, shine steadily for year after year, century after century. But there are some which don't. And one of these variable stars is scat. It's an unstable, ancient star. It's swelling and shrinking, and it's changing in brightness as it does so. And the magnitude range is from about 2.3 to 2.8. And you can quite easily study it from night to night and draw a kind of a light curve, as I did a little while ago. What I did was to compare SCAT with Markab, which signs steadily at magnitude 2.5, and Algonib at 2.9. And plotting that from night to night, you can get a well-defined curve, which has a period of something like 38 days. Not absolutely constant, because this is what's called a semi-regular variable, and we never quite know what's going to happen next, but that is the genuine period. And if you follow SCAT from night to night and compare it with Markab, you'll see that it really is changing. Now, although the flying horse is marked mainly by the square, it's not the entire constellation. There's more of it, and there's one more fairly bright star, Epsilon Pegasi, or Nf, which again is orange, and uh, more luminous than any of the square stars, over 4,000 times as powerful as the sun. And near that is the totally unremarkable third and a half magnitude star, Theta Pegasi. But those two stars can be used to find something very interesting. Look from Theta through NF, and you'll come to a hazy blob in the sky. You won't see it with the naked eye. You will with binoculars. So simply start with Theta, sweep through NF, and then you'll come to the hazy blob, which marks Messier 15, a well-known globular cluster, not very far below naked eye visibility. And there's a telescopic picture of it. The outer parts are easy to resolve. And these globular clusters are huge symmetrical systems. This one's over 50,000 light years away. And near the center, the stars are pretty closely packed. So if we lived on the planet going around a star in the middle of a globular cluster, our night skies would be glorious, even though, of course, the separations are still of the order of oh, a light month at least, and those stars can hardly ever collide. But certainly, this is one of the best of all globular clusters and very easy to locate. Now, let's go back for a moment to our map of Pegasus. 
There are the four stars of the square, and there in the upper left is Alpharetz. But for some reason, and I don't know why this is, some years ago, the controlling body of world astronomy, the IAU, took Alpharetz away from Pegasus and transferred it to the next constellation, Andromeda. And I don't know why that was, because Alpharetz clearly belongs to the Pegasus pattern, and Andromeda really has no marked pattern at all. In mythology, it represents a princess, but uh, certainly I can't make a princess out of that pattern. And certainly, to me, Alpharetz does appear to belong to the square. We've got a picture here which shows uh, where the linkage is. Up in the left-hand corner, we have the brightest star of Perseus, which is Merfac. Down to the lower right, two stars of the square, Alpharetz and Scat. And the Andromeda is marked by the line of scars running down from the top left down to the lower right. And uh, they're of the second magnitude and quite easy to find. And two of them are decidedly orange, about the same brightness as the Alpharet. These are Mylach and Almark. And beyond them, we come to the variable star Algol in Perseus, the eclipsing binary. But Almark is an interesting star. With the naked eye, it looks perfectly ordinary, orange second magnitude scar. But telescopically, it is seen to be double. And there's an impression of what Almark looks like through a telescope. And uh, because the magnitudes are just below two and just above five, almost any small telescope will separate the two, and it's not very far beyond binocular range. And I always think of that as one of the loveliest double stars in the entire sky. But, of course, the most celebrated object in Andromeda is the great spiral Messier 31. Messier was the great French astronomer who catalogued these things way back in 1781. And M31 is the nearest of the really large external galaxies. You can see it with the naked eye, but only, I'm afraid, on a dark night, so again, you've got to wait to get the moon out of the way. First of all, start with Mylach, sweep up to the two fainter stars, Nu and Nu Andromeda, and there, slightly up to the right of Nu, you will see the hazy patch which marks M31. This is a photograph, a small scale, taken by Commander Hatfield. There is the great spiral right in the middle of the picture, and that's the kind of view you're going to get with binoculars or a small telescope. But of course, when you photograph it with a large telescope, this is the kind of view you get. And you see there that, in fact, it is a spiral galaxy, rather larger than our Milky Way, but placed at an unfavorable angle to us, so the full beauty of the spiral is unfortunately lost. But I think it's a great pity. If it were broadside on, it would look like a huge Catherine wheel. And nearby, there are two more satellite galaxies. Down to the lower left is Messier 32, and to the upper right, NGC 205. And NGC stands for New General Catalogue, which is now more than a century old. And these are not spirals. This is a picture of M32, it's an elliptical galaxy, and a rather irregular one, NGC 205. And they are much smaller than M31. Now, in fact, M31 is rather over two million light years away. So when we look at it, we're seeing it as it used to be two million years ago. And it's a huge system, larger than our own Milky Way galaxy, and containing more than our own quota of 100,000 million stars. The first man who proved this was Edwin Hubble, after whom the Space Telescope's named. And what he did was to study certain interesting stars inside the Great Spiral. And these are known as Cepheid variables. They change in brightness in the same way as SCAT does, but they're different kinds of variables. They have short periods, and they're very regular. And the way in which they change tells us how luminous they really are. And of course, if you know how luminous a star really is, and how bright it looks, then you can tell how far away it is. And that's what Hubble did, and proved for the first time that M31 really is an external galaxy. He got the original distance rather wrong, but now we know it is over two million light years, and so we're seeing it as it was more than two million years ago. It's a member of what we call the local group, and even at that distance, it is still one of the very closest of the external systems. So uh, do go and find it, easy with binoculars, and uh, when the moon's not there, easy also with the naked eye. Also close to Andromeda, there are two more constellations worth finding. One is Aries, the ram, often called the first constellation of the zodiac, which it once was, though it now isn't. The brightest star there is orange, called Hamel, but the interesting one is Mesartim, or Gamma Aeriatus, which is the third member of the trio, not very bright, but when you look at that through a telescope, you'll find it's made up of two stars, and these are perfect twins, not very far below binocular range, and almost any telescope will separate them. And that's one of the most perfect pairs, I think, in the entire sky. And between Aries and Andromeda, there's another small constellation. This is Triangulum, 
the triangle, which really does one of the look like the objects it's meant to represent, where the three main stars do make up a triangle. They are not very bright, but here there is another spiral galaxy, M33. You can find that quite easily with binoculars, although, oddly enough, the surface brightness is low and it's quite elusive telescopically. That picture, of course, is a false colour picture, but it does show the form of M33, a looser spiral than the Andromeda spiral, uh, rather further away and considerably smaller. It's about 2.3 million light years away from us. But it is worth finding. Now, also from the square of Pegasus, we can locate the most southerly of the first magnitude stars ever to be seen from Britain. And this is Fomalhaut in the southern fish. What you do, take a line from Scat through Markab, extend it downwards almost to the southern horizon, and there you will find Fomalhaut. From North Scotland, it barely rises. It's one of our closer neighbours, 22 light years away, 13 sun power, and very interesting. In 1983, the infrared astronomical satellite IRS went round the Earth and mapped the sky in infrared. And around certain stars, it discovered cool material. And one of these was Fomalhaut. And it could be that Fomalhaut contains this kind of material around it. I am not saying that there is a planetary system around Fomalhaut. I am saying that there could be. And as Spanish resenters, it is quite a good candidate. Although whether that impression is accurate or not, only time will tell. Well, Fomalhaut's easy to find. The only danger is confusing it with Difta or Beta Ceti, which you can find by using the other two stars in the square, Alpha Rats and Algolib, and they lead down to Difta. But Difta is a magnitude fainter than Fomalhaut and rather higher up, so I don't think there's much danger of confusing the two. Uh, Cetus, the whale, which Difta is the leading star, is not very conspicuous, but it's um, not difficult to find. The most famous object there is the red variable Mara, which has a period of 331 days and can reach the second magnitude, but at the moment it's near minimum, and it's visible with the naked eye for only a few weeks every year, so at the moment I'm afraid you need binoculars or a telescope to find it. And also, in the whale's head, there's another spiral galaxy, the massive Messier 77. And that's different, as you can see, from M31, with our big nucleus, our active centre, and tightly wound spiral arms. Rather below binocular range, but a small telescope will show it. Well, there are plenty of other things to be seen. For example, let's come back to Cassiopeia. Use two stars of the W to find the sword handle in Perseus. And that's made of two open clusters side by side. And not far away, we are coming now to the lovely Seven Sisters or Pleiades, the most famous of all star clusters. This is my own small-scale picture, and here's a much larger view of it, showing the nebulosity spread among the stars, showing that the Pleiades is a young cluster. And when you start to see the Seven Sisters in the evening skies we're doing now, I always know that winter, with its frost, frosts and fogs, is not too far away. So all in all, even though we haven't yet got around, there's plenty to see in the autumn sky. Don't forget, if you want the latest information, then ring up our Sky at Night information line, and the number is 0891-8003, or dial up CFAX, page 615. When I come back next month, we're going right out into deep space and talking about gravitational lenses. So until then, good night. <laughs>